In this video, I'm going to review how to interpret a CTA of the chest pulmonary embolism protocol. This is a very commonly ordered scan out of the emergency department because people come in with symptoms that are concerning for pulmonary emboli all the time. Some of those common symptoms are chest pain, mostly like pleuritic pain, shortness of breath. An isolated syncopal episode is a concern for pulmonary embolus. That's one of the causes of that. And then a lot of times people have elevated D-dimers, which is a very nonspecific test, but a pulmonary embolus is a common cause of an elevated D-dimer. So these tests are timed very specifically. The patient receives intravenous contrast, and you want to time the study to where most of the contrast is in the pulmonary artery here, because you want the contrast in the pulmonary artery to be able to identify filling defects, and those filling defects are the pulmonary emboli. So I'm going to review my search pattern first, and then we'll look at a couple cases of positive studies so you can see what pulmonary emboli actually look like. So when I read these scans, I go straight to the pulmonary artery and just start there, and I search through all the pulmonary arteries to find the PE. So the first thing I do is look at the main pulmonary artery and then the left and right main pulmonary branches. A saddle pulmonary embolus is something you see near the pulmonary trunk and involving either the right or the left or both. You're not going to miss a saddle pulmonary embolus. They're not subtle at all. We'll see a good case of that shortly. And then what you have to do after that is you have to kind of just individually track all the individual pulmonary arteries out to the periphery and look for any subtle or not so subtle filling defects and by filling defect, I mean you'll see a change in the density within the pulmonary artery. So you'll see them as bright, and then all of a sudden they'll drop off, and you'll see a dark spot within the pulmonary artery. And that's the filling defect in pulmonary embolus. So I'm, I literally go through, and I track every individual branch. And here are our left upper lobes. Then I go down, and you have your left lingular branches. So I track those out. Then you have all your lower lobe branches down here. So you basically have to just track every single one and try to find a pulmonary embolus. Do the same thing on the right. You have the right main, you have your right middle lobes here, and you've got all your right lower lobes. So you're just tracking all of these, looking for subtle changes in the density within the pulmonary arteries, and that density difference is a pulmonary embolus. So in this case, this is a case of there's no pulmonary embolus, so this is a nice normal study. Then after I have searched all the pulmonary arteries, I stay within the cardiovascular thought process and just look at the rest of the cardiovascular structures. So you have your aortic arch. You know, if someone coming in with chest pain and you're looking for a pulmonary embolus, don't forget to look at the aorta because you could catch a dissection. That's another common cause of chest pain. Sometimes the aorta is not quite opacified enough to be able to see a dissection. In this case, I think it is. There's no dissection here, but be sure to look at that aorta. All your cardiac chambers, you've got your right atrium, right ventricle, got your left ventricle, and you've got your left atrium. So something to always keep in mind with these pulmonary emboli is if you see a pulmonary embolus, the next question you want to answer is, is there right heart strain? There are some different markers that you can look at on imaging to suggest right heart strain. One of the first things is flattening or bowing of the interventricular septum. And this is what I'm circling here. This is the muscular interventricular septum. If that is flattened or bowed towards the left ventricle, that could be a sign of right heart strain. Similarly, if the right ventricle is really dilated, that's another thing that could suggest right heart strain. And then if there's contrast reflux into the inferior vena cava, which you can't really see it because there's no contrast, but that's right here. If you see contrast within the inferior vena cava, there is then the suggestion that the right heart is failing. There are a lot of chronic causes of right heart failure, but in the acute setting, and someone that doesn't previously have right heart failure, you have to think about right heart strain from a pulmonary embolus if you see contracts in that IVC down by the liver. So after looking at all the cardiac chambers and thinking about right heart strain, of course, if we have a pulmonary embolus, I look for a pericardial effusion, look at the coronary arteries, sometimes you can see calcified atherosclerosis. Be sure to follow that aorta all the way down, look at as much of the aorta as you can. You can even see your celiac branch here, and you get your SMA here. People can have thrombi that form in those, you don't want to miss that, even though that's the study is not looking for that, you can see it, so you're responsible for it. After looking at all the cardiovascular structures, I then just go back to my normal search pattern for a CT chest, which I've done before, but I take a look at the neck, look at the thyroid, I then look for lymph nodes in your axillary regions, your hilar regions, mediastinal lymph nodes that are by the trachea and by the aortic arch, so I'm looking for nodes. Then I switch over to my lung window. So here's your lung window, and this is a different case, but I look at all the lungs. In this case, these lungs have some pathology, and we'll talk about that later. But you search all your lungs, you're looking for ground glass opacities, consolidation. After you look at the lung parenchyma, then you think about the pleura. So look for pleural effusions and pneumothorax. I'm going to switch back over to my other scan. So after looking at the lungs, I then go down and look at the upper abdomen. Sometimes you'll catch a little bit of the gallbladder. Cholecystitis presenting as chest pain is not impossible. So if you see the gallbladder, look for it. And if it looks inflamed or something, think about cholecystitis. You can get some of your liver, don't miss a liver mass. You get some of the kidneys, so take a look at those. Then you have the spleen, stomach, and you get a little bit of colon here. 
So always look at the upper abdomen on any study that you're doing of the chest. You can see some of the upper abdomen. I then do the chest wall in, in bones. So I look at the chest wall. Sometimes you can catch a breast malignancy or at least catch something that looks suspicious that you could then suggest a mammogram. So I look at the chest wall. I'll obviously look at it posteriorly as well, tracking that all the way. And then I look at the bones, and I'm not going to go through all of them here, but you get the spine, you get the ribs, you get the scapula, you get the humeri, you have the clavicles. Look for fractures. If there's not a history of trauma, that's not likely, but you don't want to miss a compression fracture in an osteoporotic patient. Obviously, looking for masses. It is not uncommon at all for someone to come in and get a CT chest and we find sclerotic or lytic lesions in their spine and unfortunately we're having to then say this person probably has a malignancy. So that is my search pattern and basic approach to the CT chest pulmonary embolism study. I'm now gonna go over to a couple positive studies to show you what pulmonary emboli actually look like. So this is a nice case of a pretty subtle pulmonary embolus. So I start looking at my pulmonary artery and then I then search the left lower lobe the left lingular branches, the left upper lobe. I don't see anything on the left side for sure. And you go to the right, and I'm gonna start by looking at the right lower lobe. So I'm following these pulmonary arteries out here. So follow with me where my mouse is. And then there's some pulmonary emboli. So I'm gonna circle it to make it easier. So right here, so watch this branch. This is what I'm talking about with the change in the density within the artery. You're seeing contrast and then you don't see contrast. That change is because there's an embolus blocking that pulmonary artery. So I'm gonna go through that again. So keep your eyes on, on these areas right here, this pulmonary artery. It's bright and it's dark. So that's the change. That's the pulmonary embolus right in there. And so that's actually a pretty subtle case. And that's a, just a little bit of clot. In 90% of cases, if you find one, there's another one somewhere. I'm not going to go through and search the rest of them because we found the one. I've showed you what it looks like. I'm going to move on to a much less subtle case, but a nice example of what right heart strain looks like. Okay. So here's our pulmonary artery, and as you can see, there are huge filling defects in the right main and left main branches, and they involve the distal arteries. So the low bars, the segmentals, and the subsegmental arteries are full of clot. So this is what I would call a heavy clot burden. There's a lot of clot here. And in a case like this, when you have a lot of clot, that's when you really worry about right heart strain. So in the last case, that one tiny subsegmental pulmonary embolus that we saw is not going to cause right heart strain. But when you have a lot of clot like this, you really do worry about right heart strain. So here's our interventricular septum here. Do you see how it is bowed towards the left ventricle, which almost looks like it's being smushed by a big right ventricle? That is an imaging finding of right heart strain. So that bowing of the interventricular septum here towards the left ventricle with a big, really big right ventricle, that is right heart strain by imaging. And I talked about the IVC. See how there's contrast in the IVC? That's an indicator of acute right heart failure. So we have contrast in the IVC, we have a big right ventricle, and we have a flattened interventricular septum. The pulmonary artery will also often dilate. So I take my cursor and I measure right here, and anything over 3.2 is what I've been taught is too big. In the acute setting, you worry about right heart strain. A lot of people have big pulmonary arteries from chronic pulmonary hypertension, which there are a ton of different reasons for that. But in the acute setting, in someone that didn't have a big pulmonary artery, if it's all of a sudden big and you have a lot of clot, you worry about right heart strain. And I've talked a lot about right heart strain. The reason that is, is there are interventional procedures now where you can go in and do a thrombectomy and actually take out the clot and relieve some of that right heart strain. So I talked about always looking at the lungs on these studies, and there's something you have to think about anytime you're catching a pulmonary embolus, and that is a pulmonary infarct. And so we're gonna, I'm going to show you what a pulmonary infarct looks like. This is the same case. I just switched over to the lung windows in the patient with a lot of pulmonary emboli. You can still see it on the lung window, but that's all clot in the right main pulmonary artery. The clot extends to involve all these right lower lobe branches. And as you can see, this consolidation out here in the periphery, that's what a pulmonary infarct will look like. There are these peripherally based opacities, in this case, a consolidative opacity that's kind of wedge shaped, you could argue, but that's what an infarct looks like. So that's something you want to talk about. If you see something like this, a wedge shaped consolidative opacity in a patient with a pulmonary embolus, that's a good look for a pulmonary infarct. And that's something you want to let the provider clinician know as well. So thanks very much for watching. That is it. That's my approach to the CTA pulmonary embolism study. They can be kind of tedious when you're searching the tiny little peripheral arteries for clot, but it's really gratifying when you find it and can at least give the patient an answer for why they're having pain. And the more of these you'll do, the better you get. I hope this at least helps you get started. And thank you very much for your time, and thanks for watching, and see you all next time.